Good afternoon. Now, this afternoon, what I was doing is I was walking down through the, all the brushy stuff, okay? To show you a rare lily, a rare fritillaria is the genus that only grows in a very specific kind of ecological niche, uh, which would be right over there. Uh, this lily only grows on steep, hellish slopes. Nowhere does it grow on flat ground. Uh, and it, it only, it, the, the slopes have to be, it doesn't just have to be land that's at a slope, at a slant. It's got to be land that's literally just composed of a very unstable talus, uh, composed of a rock called serpentine, which is also the California state rock. Anyway, you got a bunch of claytonias coming up. That genus is all, you get this genus in the Midwest too. They call, they call them the spring beauties there in Montiese is the family. Here's a delphinium coming up, not open yet. Real pretty member of the uh, ranunculus family, the ranunculaceae. Now, as you can see, this rock is uh, it's it's basically just you know the way the way that the rock is created when it fractures and it does fracture very easily. It's a somewhat soft rock. It readily breaks up when it fractures. It fractures into just the right size of talus, uh, you know, about the size of a marble. And I don't know why it does this exactly, but it does it wherever this. Uh, wherever this rock occurs. You'll get these steep talus slopes and uh, well the thing I'm going to show you is right up there. I'm going to try to not fuck up too much habitat with my goddamn boots when I'm good enough to. I'll show you. i to take off my boots because uh, they're up there and I don't want to fuck them up. You know I'm probably going to mess them up a little bit but I don't want to mess them up too bad. But uh, basically uh, to, to reiterate these are in the lily family okay and in the lily family in California you got a couple different genera. You got Calicortis, you got Scoliopus, you got uh, Lilium, and then you got this one, Fritillaria. Now, the Fritillaria genus is probably, I don't know, a dozen species in them in California. Uh, they're widespread all over the Northern Hemisphere, and uh, there's a lot of different species. They got Fritillarias in fucking Iran, and some of those are real pretty, but good luck getting to go see those. Uh, no matter how pretty those are, Regardless, they're certainly not as pretty as these. Now, uh, fritillarias don't always flower every year, and when they don't, they put out these resting leaves, and uh, basically, there's a bulb down there. They're what you call a geophyte. And during the years when they're not flowering, they just send out these resting leaves, they gather a bunch of carbohydrates through photosynthesis, store them in that bulb, and then die back uh, once uh, the dry season starts, which should be in about a month, two months, three months, and uh, they go dormant for the summer. They need summer dry. But then when they do choose to flower, this is what they look like. And this is Fritillaria falcata, perhaps one of the most exquisite, beautiful fucking Fritillarias that we have here in California. Now some of them nod down. Uh, some of the Fritillarias nod down like a finis and striata. Uh, but this one actually points up and I believe I think Purdy Eye does it too, which is another rare one. Now this lily, like I said before, only grows on serpentine talus slopes. It grows nowhere on flat ground, and it doesn't, it doesn't just need a slope, it needs this talus. If you were to dig down and dig beneath that, uh, that talus, down about six inches down, well first you'd see a white stem, and then six inches below that, maybe eight inches sometimes, depending on how deep they are, you would see a bulb. And that's where the juice is stored, that uh, produces this flower every year. Let's say, let's get up and take a closer look at it. Now here's one that seems like it just germinated. Just looks like a little blade of grass because fritillarias of course are monocots. They just have that parallel ven venation unlike uh, dicots and eudicots uh, which of course have cross venation. There's another one that just germinated and of course here's, uh, here's quite a few that are uh, flowering, producing nectar, attracting pollinators, and uh, of course, typical lily, you got the six stamens in there, those are the male parts, and then uh, you got the stigma, which you look at that is recurved, the stigma is that trilobed, that three-lobed piece in the center that is uh, open and waiting to receive pollen. Jesus Christ, I don't want to, you know, it's kind of hard to do this, to get up there. But, uh, but there they are, and there's uh, quite a few of them. This is a pretty remote population, 
not very well known. I believe this population was first found in the 80s. And uh, look at all that Claytonia just shimmering up there. This population was first found in the uh, in the 1980s, and then it was uh, refound. Not refound, but no one had, as far as I know, had really visited it much uh, until last year, the year before. So these guys have been allowed to do their thing with minimal disturbance. I think maybe the deer come back here and nibble on them sometimes. Somebody's been back here. There's footprints, but I can't tell if it's animals or. Uh, or what? Uh-oh. You know what? There's my uh, my little crappy tripod from last year. I guess I left that here. Oops. So like I was saying, this rock is toxic to most plants, but many plants have evolved to tolerate it. Uh, and so because of that, they've been able to edge out the competition of many of the, uh, especially the non-native plants. Like the, that grass that's beneath all those oak trees over there is entirely, almost entirely non-native grasses that weren't here uh, 300 years ago they arrived with the Europeans and the Spanish who brought the cattle and uh, that's uh, you know they're not uh, they essentially somewhat wiped out a lot of the native flora because the native flora just can't compete with it you know but then you go to a desert or a serpentine uh, hillside and uh, those plants can't grow on it because it's toxic now as you can see this is quite the looker it's quite a goddamn exquisite lily Okay, and it's got the typical lily morphology of the flower. See that thing in the center? Looks like uh, bug antennas. There's three of them. That's the stigma. It's a, it's a tri-lobed stigma. And this one's somewhat recurved. This one right here. And that basically is what receives the pollen. And then you got these, the stamens, which surround that, uh, that style and stigma. And those stamens that have anthers on the end of them, and those anthers have pollen. So pollinators are attracted to the nectaries, which are, you can't really see them, but they're basically glands that produce nectar, and they're down there at the base of that column right down there. The pollinators go in there, they get the nectaries, and, and what the shit, and when they're doing that, they brush against those uh, anthers, pick up some of the pollen, and visit the next flower, and they bring some of that pollen to the stigma right there. And then, uh, you know, about another month, these will all be done, maybe two weeks, and you'll get a, a three-lobed capsule, that flower will, will dehiss and you'll get a three-lobed capsule uh, in that ovary. This ovary down there matures. The ovary's, uh, where's that on these? It's right, see, it's on top of the corolla. The ovary's about on, on top of the corolla. That, that the ovary matures into a tree-lobed capsule and it's got a bunch of seed in it. And then uh, basically uh, the plant goes dormant. All the energy goes back into the bulb, uh, which is about six, eight inches down there in the soil. And the the leaves dry out, the flower dries out, plants dormant, and that capsule uh, splits open, and then releases all the seed, and then uh, they germinate next year. Here's some ones that just germinated now. See, they look like little blades of grass. Little blades of grass right there, you know. And it'll probably be four or five years before those guys get big enough. Uh, they they end up storing enough carbohydrates in that underground bulb to finally do their thing and flower you know but they they thrive here because not like i said nothing else can compete the only other thing that's here is this this claytonia which is in the montiaceae well, you got some clarkies too up there look at that claytonia's just going off shimmering in the sun now fritillarias of course don't flower every year see these guys aren't flowering this year those are what are called resting leaves they just send a leaf up they're gathering carbohydrates photosynthesizing and doing their thing they store that shit back in a bulb which again is six to eight inches below the uh, soil right there beneath the surface of this talus and uh and then the leaf uh dries out and it goes dormant for the season because you know in july july right here is is fucking 120 105 degrees you know real hot real dry you know it'll stop raining about now won't get any rain again till november or december such is the case of the Mediterranean climate, you know, wherever they occur. You get the Mediterranean climates, of course, on uh, the west side of continents, bordering oceans. They get those cold ocean currents. That's what causes, that's what causes the uh, precipitation regime of uh, winter rain, summer dry nice. Look at it. Isn't he beautiful? Look at it. Look, look at this guy. He's like a maroon color. 
I mean, this is, this again, this plant only occurs from San Francisco Bay Area, southeast to about San Benito County. It's very rare and it needs this exact type of ecological niche, a slope composed of serpentine talus to do its thing. So, so anyway, here's one that I that I accidentally unearthed with my uh, didn't unearth it, but I just uh, stepped here and the soil collapsed the uh, down slope. But you could see uh, this one basil leaf. This plant's not going to flower this year. It's just gathering carbs. It'll probably flower next year. Gathering carbs for that bulb that's down there, about another two or three inches down there beneath the soil surface, and it just kind of. Uh, rests on the, the talus surface and then it, it that's white because it doesn't need to photosynthesize this was buried by soil and then uh that bulb is you know another two and like i said two or three inches down there and that's the way all these go they just uh you know they just uh f come up every year and if it's been a good rain year they put out a big basal leaf and they gather more uh carbohydrates via photosynthesis than they otherwise would if it was a lousy rain year and then uh they go dormant in uh, about May, and uh, just sit in a dormant state in that completely dry soil, uh, which is moderated, however, from the high temperatures that this area receives in the summer. And then uh, once the rains start in the winter, they uh, they send that leaf back up. Actually, they probably send the leaf back up in about February once it once it warms up. February, March, once it warms up, and. Uh, and if the prior years were good and they got enough energy to do so, they'll flower. They'll put out these little flowers. So a slope composed of serpentine talus rock might seem like it's a bit of an obscure ecological niche uh, that would even exist. But uh, when you look at the way this stuff fractures, it makes sense. See? It just happens to fracture in generally all, all relatively the same size. Little pebbles that all are relatively the same size and uh, don't get much bigger or smaller and that's just the way that these rocks break up and they break up really easily it's, it, it, like I said it's a pretty soft rock it's very unstable and that's why uh, when rich people in Marin County build their homes on some of the serpentine up there and then wonder why their their slope is falling down and their their house is about to uh, you know crash off the hillside it's kind of amusing so anyway here, here's a bit more open uh, of a more open and exposed of a serpentine environment okay so we're gonna see if there's any more of that damn fertile area falcata up here i mean i know there is i was here last year but uh, this population's not doing so hot see there's some basil leaves it just uh doesn't get enough moisture here you know but uh, as you can see you got an onion coming up too how about that nice allium so you can see you still got the same thing going on. This very unstable serpentine talus, which breaks up and forms the only substrate that this little lily lives in. There's a tiny one. Jesus Christ. They're really not they're really not doing too good here, huh? Too exposed. So uh, I'm not seeing too much fertilaria here, but uh, you know, think on a positive side. Maybe it uh, maybe it just uh, didn't come up yet. We are a little higher. Think on a positive side. It's not my normal uh, style right there, but we'll see where it gets us. Look, here's some basil leaves, so you know they're there. But uh, I don't see any flowering yet, so... I mean, I'm sure this population at one point occurred further down the wash. I mean, there's still a couple plants down there, but the main population seems to be up here. So it's uh, climbing up towards the water source. Oh, look, there's one. There's a little flower, nice. But you can see that uh, this population is getting nowhere near the amount of moisture that the population that I was just at five miles uh, to the east is. Jake, you got anything to say to this? What's going on? Anyway, you know, so I used to think it was kind of a weenie thing to be into lilies, but they really make me feel overall much less homicidal 
And uh, they, they help me deal with the stress and anxiety of the modern life, you know. And if you don't feel stress and anxiety living in the modern world, you're not paying attention. So, but this has got to be my favorite by far. And you can see, it just occupies such a weird ecological niche, the serpentine talus. And when you get up close to it, it's such a beautiful, dainty little fucker too. Look at it. Look at that. You got those pink anthers. That Corolla that's just blow your mind. It's like a psychedelic void. Where's the stigma on that though? Don't even see the stigma on this. What's going on?